Let's go to the next talk uh, by Dr. Pooja. She's going to take us through the surface management and abrasions in character corners. Welcome, Pooja. Thank you, sir. So I would like to thank uh, Tithyal, sir, Manpreet, uh, Praful, and the entire AIS team for uh, giving me this opportunity to talk. So I'm going, uh, I'm going to be talking about lasers in keratoconus. Do they have a role and what is the impact on higher order aberrations? So uh, there is a very simplified nomogram of how do you go about with uh, a keratoconus patient when it walks into your clinic. When do you pro observe? When do you uh, do a cross-linking? And if you're doing a cross-linking, when do you do a topo-guided cross-linking, epi on, epi off, or as uh, Ritika ma'am mentioned, uh, ICRS, or when do you do a keratoplasty? So the first criteria which would come is if your corneal, uh, you do a topo-guided uh, PRK for cross-linking only if your corneal thickness is more than 450, and if it's an early or moderate disease. If it's an advanced disease, try avoid, or if it's a corneal thickness less than 450, please do not uh, go ahead and do a topo-guided PRK because it's already a weaker cornea, it will make it more weaker. And uh, this is a simplified nomogram, how we uh, apply for cross-linking. If there is a progression, if your visual acuity is good, uncorrected and best corrected, if the patient is, is okay with contact lenses, if the aberrations are very well controlled and the quality of vision is good, you just go ahead and do a manual cross-linking. But when does a, a topo-guided PRK or a laser-based cross-linking comes into picture is when your uncorrected visual acuity and best corrected visual acuity are less. That would be less than 618 or 69 respectively. If the patient is contact lens intolerant or if the aberrations, the higher order aberrations, the coma, the trifolds are on the higher side or if the patient is not happy with the quality of vision with glasses and of course it's a contact lens intolerant patient, then you uh, go ahead and do a uh, topo-guided uh, PRK with cross-linking or a laser-based cross-linking. Now, how do you choose what to do there? You then divide between a centered cone and a decentered cone. If it's a centered cone, you see the pachymetry. If the pachymetry is good, you go ahead with a T, uh, TCAT procedure. But if it's a decentered cone, then uh, Ritika Mama has already explained that you go ahead and do an intact along with uh, cross-linking. So what are the benefits of uh, uh, when do you do a laser-based cross-linking? Again, a uh, poor vision, poor uh, contact lens fit, increased aberrations. And when you do a TCAT, it makes your cornea much more regular. The sphericity is very well controlled. So that is why your uh, best corrected visual acuity would be better. There, uh, because of the regularization of the surface, there would be an improved contact lens fit. And as the aberrations will also reduce, the quality of vision after surgery will improve. So that's when TCAT comes into play. And it's not, uh, so you have to be but very clear here. When you are explaining your patients a laser-based cross-linking, a laser-based procedure, you have to tell them that the aim here is not, that the refractive error is not completely going to go away. The aim here is not to completely reduce the refractive error, but to regularize the surface and take care of the aberration. So post-surgery, your quality of vision will be good, and as the surface is regular, the contact lens will be good, uh, fit will be good. So you have to explain the patient very clearly why are you doing a laser-based cross-linking, because otherwise they'll have unrealistic expectations, and they'll be like, after surgery, they'll be like, why do I have glasses? Why do I have to wear contact lenses? So you have to be very uh, clear here. And uh, this is what happens. So there are various options which we have. We have various platforms. The most commonly being used are the Wavelight and the Schwinn platform. In Wavelight, you can do a TPRK, which is also known as Athens Protocol, and the PTK, which is known as Cretans Protocol. So what is Athens uh, Protocol? It's nothing but a PRK. Uh, you get these two types of scenario. One is a decentered cone and a centered cone, and you can have a high, uh, mixed astigmatism or a myopia with cylinder. Now, always do a zero rule. Always feed in the refraction as zero and see what is the center and the maximum ablation. And based on the center and maximum ablation, you decide whether to go ahead with it or not. If on zero refraction only, if your uh, ablation is beyond 40 microns, then this would not be the right case for doing a topo-guided PRK. A topo-guided PRK should always be cut off at 40 to 45 microns of ablation, irrespective of what your corneal thickness is. Even if your corneal thickness is a 500 sometimes, don't go beyond 40 microns would be the key factor here. And uh, then you see the difference between the central and periphery, because if there is a difference, if the center is 25 and the peripheral is 57, you can see there is a difference of 25 uh, microns. This is going to induce a myopia. So whenever it induces a myopia, this patient already has plus 3 and this 25 microns is going to compensate for around 2 diopters. So you will uh, plan your treatment accordingly and uh, only uh, this is already compensated. So here you are only going to treat cylinder. But if you have a myopic, uh, this is what the post-operative -op outcome would be. But if you have a myopic patient and this is what your ablation here is, the center is 12 and the peripheral is 29, the difference is hardly less than 10 microns. So this is not going to induce much of myopia. 
it is not going to induce like a minus 1 or minus 2 diopters also because every micron uh, it needs 12 mic every uh, diopter it needs 12 micron of ablation so here the difference between the peripheral and central ablation is less than 10 diopters so it's not going to induce any uh, myopic error correction so here you will treat both the sphere and cylinder um, uh, keeping in mind that you shouldn't go beyond 30 to 40 percent of sphere, 40 percent of cylinder, or uh, if you're uh, or the corneal th uh, uh, the the uh, ablation should not be beyond uh, 40 micron. Uh, so that is what you would do. So let's see a case example in wave light. This is how the uh, workflow is. You do a topolizer, you do the scan quality check, and then you export the data to the refractive platform, and then you plan the treatment. So this is how the planning looks like. You go to the topo guided mode. You see the quality of scans. You see the Q value. Q value has to be uh, between 0 to minus 1. Otherwise, the machine doesn't let you go beyond. Then you enter the refraction. But then, the, and this would what it would show as. You do not treat the entire refraction here. You put the 0, 0 refraction and see what is the center and peripheral going to be. Uh, here, the difference between the myopic and the uh, hyperopic ablation is 20 microns. So, as mentioned before, it's going to induce a myopia of 1.5 diopters. So, we will treat 30 percent of myopia and 30 to 40 percent of cylinder here, and this is what the treatment is going to be like. And this is how the uh, post op outcome looks like. So, this is how you plan on an Alcon platform. But if you have a Schwinn platform, what you do? Again, uh, this planning here is going to be different. Uh, you export the scans, as in sorry, you import the, import the scans from Cirrus platform and you go to the uh, PRK mode and do a 0, 0 refraction and see what is the minimum ablation on 0, 0. Here uh, you have an added advantage here that here you can customize the abrasions. These are how the abrasions look like. Traditionally, the machine is going to treat all the abrasions. But in Schwinn machine, you can customize the aberration by using a depth minimize. It has an AI based algorithm where you, if you click on the depth minimize, the machine will choose which aberrations to correct and which aberrations not to correct. So whatever aberrations are on the higher side, it's going to correct it and whatever aberrations are on the lower side, it is going to leave it alone. Now why is it important or why will this be useful is whenever you treat any aberrations, it burns certain amount of uh, certain microns of cornea. So if you customize the aberration, if you choose like I want to treat particular aberrations and not the uh, entire aberrations, it will reduce the amount of tissue being burned with the laser. So this comes into a very uh, important like step when it, you are dealing with keratoconus uh, patients because you do want to save the tissue as much as possible. So that is why you can customize the aberrations here, which one to treat and which one not to treat. And it also, as mentioned here, from 89 microns, it came down to 45 microns. And now I can go ahead and do a treatment. If it was 86, I couldn't have done the treatment. But now it's come down, I can go ahead and done a, do a topo guided treatment. So this is how the Schwinn platform uh, comes into uh, picture, and this is how we treat. But the question comes here is, I'm oh, sorry, what if, in spite of doing all this, the ablation is still on the higher side? Even if you have done a depth minimize, even if you have chosen the aberrations and all, what do you do? So we have a technique where you can customize the PTK only on the cone area and you can only burn 20 microns of stromal tissue in the cone area and uh, regularize the surface. So it's a called a customized PTK. So you go to the PTK cam mode and you measure the dimensions of the cone, the vertical and the horizontal diameter and you see where if the cone is centered or decentered. If the cone is decentered, then you uh, find out how decentered it is uh, from the center of the pupil and then you take all the parameters and feed it into the fl platform here the PTK cam mode platform here and uh, this is uh, you could see the topography that it was a decentered cone and uh, this is what it's going to burn so when the cornea is a thinner when or when the ablation is on the higher side but you still want to regularize the surface uh, a customized PTK which is also known as TREK can come into picture and it help it can help into regularization of the surface and it can uh, help us in achieving a decent uh, flattening as well. So these are the options which we have available uh, for us which helps us not only to regularize the surface to reduce the refractive error to uh, have a better contact lens fit a better quality of vision uh, after surgery uh, while con controlling the ablations. Thank you. Pooja, really a nice uh, overview of the entire uh, TCAT. Uh, just one concern, if you're going to be ablating over the cone itself, would you not be making it more thin and the irregularity more pronounced because of the difference in the forces now acting upon it? 
So ma'am, we had the same concern that if we are burning the cone area, especially uh, like on the weakest area, it is going to make it steeper. So uh, when we devised this technique, what we had done was we have uh, done uh, studies like on biomechanics, where we have done the pre and post uh, stress strain index. We have done the pre and post uh, uh, detailed biomechanics with our uh, wavefront model with our scientists. And we have also done some work on collagen imaging, where we have seen how the collagen behaves before and after this trek procedure. So with all these procedures, uh, we have seen that it does remain stable. It does not make your cornea excessively weaker after surgery or it does not induce weakening. And now we have data. So we started this technique in 2017. So now we are in 2023 and we are going to publish five year data of how stable it is. So like other cross-linking cases, there are chances of progression, but the incidence of progression with manual cross-linking or a topo guided cross-linking and trek uh, is similar. So it's not making, at five years we do know that it's not making the cornea weaker. Also now there are cross-linking uh, possibility of only the cone, so you could maybe combine it with that and yes, it will make it more stable. Yeah, so, but I still, we, in spite of doing this, we would still prefer that along with the cone area, the uh, surrounding area can also be diseased. And we do not have proof right now about how much disease the surrounding cornea is going to be. So till we have the proof of it, better to manually remove the epithelium surrounding and do a cross-linking. Dr. Pooja, that was a wonderful talk. Uh, do you routinely combine all these PTKs with CXL? All the times. All the time, same sitting. <coughs> Nowadays, you know, most of the physicians, they do CXL. So uh, is there any difference when you are doing this on a prior CXL done uh, cornea and simultaneously doing CXL? So uh, there are reports, as sir, you suggested that your patients do it on a cross-linked eye already. So if you're doing it on a cross-linked eye, that is not a absolute contraindication. But yes, there are a few things you have to keep in mind is that this is a pre cross linked cornea, the keratocytes and the fibroblasts which are going to be there are going to be different. So the, if you do a uh, laser on this eye, the chances of haze or scar uh, is going to be different. Also, the outcomes might not be predicted because it's an already cross-linked eye. So, for example, I'm, achi I'm tra targeting to achieve 70% of correction. I might not always achieve 70% correction. Sometimes I can land up into an over or under correction. And there might be more chances of uh, prediction error here. And of course, uh, when if you're doing it on a pre-cross-linked eye, uh, there are literature which suggests that you should use mitomycin uh, in this eyes. You, traditionally, you would not use it, but if you are doing a laser on a cross-linked eye, you use mitomycin to prevent haze, is what I would suggest, but sir can add if he wants to. <laughs> I, I remember doing, you know, a study on that, uh, because we did have a lot of patient post cross-linked uh, keratoconus eyes, and we did TCAT for these patients. Uh, I waited for six months minimum for these patients yes. to stabilize not only the uh, characteristic uh, density wise for the ocular surface also and and the keratometry keeps changing after cross-linking and you're not sure what will be the final keratometry for these patients so minimum weight was six months for these patients then subsequently did uh, tcat and uh, some cases we succeeded to improve their you know wavefront but uh, you are right uh, it's, it's better to do a primary procedure than a secondary procedure possible nowadays uh, just a comment, I think very difficult topic that you have uh, addressed very well. But uh, what is your regimen for the post-operative treatment uh, in these patients? What so, do you sir, treat them with and how long? So post-surgery, -pro uh, until the epithelium has healed, we only use antibiotic and uh, lubricating drops. However, surgeons across the globe do use steroids from the day one as well. But in our institute, we use uh, only antibiotics and lubricating till the epithelium has healed. And once the epithelium is healed, we remove the BCL and start steroid and cyclosporin. All our keratoconus patients do get uh, a cyclosporin for six months at least. Now, why cyclosporin is, uh, Ritika ma'am did mention that a lot of these patients do have ocular surface inflammation. And when you have ocular surface, in, surface inflammation, either you can land up into an excessive scarring post cross-linking or the cross-linking effect might fail, leading to progression in spite of doing a cross-linking. So cyclosporin helps in reducing this inflammation in these cases and minimum use would be six months. So we give steroids, uh, a high dose steroid for one month followed by a low dose steroid for two months. 
and cyclosporine for all the cases. And since, since past two years, we have started using three halos based lubricating drop. So initially, we just used to use a no normal sodium hyaluronate or a CMC drop. But now, since past three years, we are using a three, halo three halos based drop because that also reduces the inflammation. So that is how our protocol is different from a normal uh, refractive surgery patient. Yeah. Um Okay, and uh, you know, um, studies have, uh, you mentioned that, that I think it should be clear to the audience that in some way when you're putting the excimer laser on the cornea and then doing cross-linking, there's a much higher incidence of haze. Now, uh, do you, have you felt the need to modify the protocol of cross-linking uh, and or which, uh, what protocol are you using uh, in these patients? So we are using an uh, accelerated protocol uh, where we do not modify anything, but we use riboflavin drops 0.1% for 20 minutes, one drop every two minutes for 20 minutes, followed by which we use a UVA light of 9 millivolts per centimeter square for 10 minutes. And we do not change this. We have not done the uh, dress, uh, the conventional protocol along with laser-based cross-linking because of the uh, eye will be exposed excessive for a longer time uh, with riboflavin drops and UVA light. So there can be more chances of haze. But we use accelerated protocol. We have started uh, after listening to you guys, mm. vitamin D and vitamin C, and also uh, a cold BCL after the procedure. Yes, ma'am. So we do listen to you. Thank you, thank you, ma'am. Vitamin D does, again, along with cyclosporin, vitamin D also helps in reducing inflammation. And after COVID-19, I think everybody has started believing that vitamin D is very important. <laughs> That also all are using mitomycin C. No, uh, so if it's a case where we are doing a laser after crosslinking, we use. But if it's a, a simultaneous case of laser and crosslinking, no, because mitomycin helps in preventing haze. But if it's an inflamed eye like a keratoconus, on an inflamed eye, if you use mitomycin, it will lead to excessive activation of keratocytes and myofibroblasts. So there you have higher chances of developing haze. And Professor Shady Awad has already published this that in a cross, if you're doing a laser-based cross-linking, avoid using mitomycin to prevent excessive haze. So it's like a double-edged sword here. Dr. Bharti, sir, any comments? No, no, everything is... Okay. So you guys have asked everything. So that's fine. Thank you, Pooja. Thank you. Wonderful Thank you, uh, explanation. And